Hello, and welcome to another episode of NanoChat Newbies, the Ionic YouTube series about what it's like to teach inorganic chemistry lecture for the very first time. My name is Amanda Rigg. I'm an associate professor at Ursinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and I'm joined by our newbie faculty, Wes Farrell and Shirley Lynn from the U.S. Naval Academy. So congratulations on making it about halfway through the semester at this point. Um, I hear you recently had your second exam, so I'm curious how that has gone. Yeah, so we, we gave an exam that covered the very end of chapter two, which was MO of diatomics, and that was kind of revisiting from the first exam because they didn't do great on that question. And then uh, we did chapter three, which is symmetry, and then also molecular orbital theory of, of larger molecules. And then we did our, our chapter four on solids, which was really, really cool and a lot of fun. I think the students, um, we, we were still, we're still uh, grading, but I think the students uh, struggled in the sense that they had two other exams already that week and we gave ours you know, on Monday and then we gave ours on Wednesday. Uh, but we were really, really glad to find questions on Viper to help us write these exams. So we, we end up using Chip Notaro's um, question on, on the uh, MO diagram of NO plus and correcting that. And then we also used Adam Johnson's square planar methane question. So yeah, so we're, we're gonna grade and see how they did. And hopefully they're all just gonna go on spring break and forget about the exam for me. Yeah, certainly some of my favorite LOs that I can find on Viper are the problem sets and exam questions because when you're in that panic mode of trying to write exams, it's so nice to be able to pull a question and know that it's been vetted and, and, and a good exam question. So great. Um, so how do you think the students maybe did on the solids versus the, the MO theory type questions? Just from my discussions with them and seeing how they did on quizzes, I think the solids became a little bit more intuitive. I think in terms of visualizing things in their head, they had a better time with that. Um, looking at symmetry operations, it seems very similar to me. Like you're trying to picture how these things rotate in your mind or reflect. It, that kind of seems the same between solids and the small molecules with symmetry. But I think with solids, they for some reason had an easier time with that. Um, and like, you know, figuring out coordination numbers and stuff. So I think they, um, had a better go of it uh, with that. And also we didn't really bring in molecular orbital theory too much with that, which I think is the most challenging part of this course so far. Um, and chapter three, which dealt with symmetry, got in, as Shirley was saying, these larger molecular orbital diagrams. So, you know, we had to revisit the molecular orbital theory from chapter two on this exam because we wanted to make sure they got a firm understanding of it. Um, but then it got even more complicated. So I think that might still be uh, a bit difficult for them. So I think solids are something they're pretty excited about. Um, but we've left that, uh, so it's not gonna be too easy for too long for them. <laughs> right, so coming up next, I think is coordination chemistry. So um, how are you guys uh, thinking about that? Are you excited to get into something that maybe is a little bit more comfortable for you? Yeah, I certainly am. I think this is something that I did really well with when I took this course way back in the day. Um, and it's what really drew me into organic, inorganic chemistry to begin with. Um, and it's what I do, you know, on a normal, like everyday basis in the lab now is this type of coordination chemistry. So um, I think, you know, I try to stay excited and upbeat about all the topics, but I think they'll really, you know, feel my excitement about this more. And hopefully that will get them excited about it as well. Um, and I'm also excited too, we can bring in some, I think really good literature discussions here uh, on some synthetic inorganic chemistry uh, and maybe even getting into catalysis towards the end of the semester. And then in, at the very end, we're gonna have them do their own literature projects, their own literature reviews. So I think this will be an exciting time to, you know, get, get into that groove with them so they can then do it on their own. Mm -hmm. I was gonna, I was gonna say that for me, coordination chemistry was never, I think, taught as sort of an explicit part of a course. And so I kind of just learned on the fly. And what I really liked about the sequence that we have in our syllabus is that we, we just are wrapping up acid-base chemistry. And to try to couch the coordination compounds in terms of like Lewis acid, Lewis base is really, really powerful. And it's just something that wasn't presented to me. And so I'm trying to make all those parallels. You know, when we talk about a ligand coordinating to a metal, like what, what do we mean? It's really just a Lewis acid, Lewis base interaction. And hopefully that that will help the students think of it that way and be more comfortable with why with why it happens. Why do you get these coordination compounds? 
And of course, you will be coming back to MO theory again, I would assume, in this uh, session as well, which I'm sure maybe the students will be less excited about. But I think that I have found that now that they see sort of an application of this, right, there's a, a really, um, you know, it's not just MO theory to look at structure and bonding, although it is, but then it starts to have some more um, sort of applications to, to larger complexes and spectroscopy and things like that. So that can be exciting and a new, a new addition to bring in, which is great. I was curious if you've ever taught your sequence where you do sort of molecular orbital theory and then jump right to the crystal field theory, ligand field theory as like one big arc rather than sort of interrupting it. Like we've, I feel like we've interrupted our, ours with solids and acid-base chemistry. There are good arguments for doing the acid-base just so that they understand where the coordination compounds come from. But I, I, I just be, yeah, I just be curious if you've tried it a different I have not. So I've basically taught it the way that you all have at this point, but I think that is a really interesting idea. Um, one of the things when I think about this course, sometimes it feels like a bunch of little modules that I'm just trying to like string together. And, you know, the question of do I just treat it like six different modules or do I actually try and have a semester long theme? And I haven't come up with a good answer to that question yet. That's interesting. I think we should uh, revisit that at some point. This might be a good way to reorder things that might make it flow a little better. I hadn't thought about that yet. So one question I don't think that has come up in any of these uh, chats so far is how you guys are approaching homework assignments. So what um, what are you doing right now and how do you think that's going? We started off with, since it's our first time, uh, sort of low bar. We, we are using, first of all, a lot of materials that our colleagues who have taught in organic previously uh, shared with us. And we're very grateful for all of their contributions. And so there are already learning objectives and homework questions chosen from the book that we're using. So we've stuck with that largely. And we've also supplemented with a few questions that our colleagues have written. And now Wes is trying to uh, add more because what we've discovered is that the students aren't doing necessarily a great job um, with what homework they're turning in. So we're asking them to turn it in. It's only like maybe six to 10 questions of various lengths each, each chapter, but the quality of answers is not great. It's, it tends to be almost the bare minimum and what you would find in the, on the online, uh, the, the answer key that's provided, you know, that's optional with the book. Um, so we're trying to get them to do more with their homework and say, you know, can you study from this afterwards? Or did you just write down Here's the, here's the point group of this species without even writing down a Lewis structure or any explanation of how they go. Yeah, it's been pretty disappointing to me because I thought this would be a nice way for them to kind of support the learning that they're doing in the class, but it seems like some of them are not really using it uh, in that vein. Some of them are, like there's been some typos in the answer key and then I've seen some notes where someone's like, hey, uh, this is the answer that it says, but I know that's wrong. So I, in my mind, that's fine. Like, and it, if anything, it actually shows that this person's really critically thinking about it, like saying, hey, I, I think this answer key, which should be the holy grail, and like, this should be gospel, um, they're, they're challenging it. So that, I think that's great. Uh, but then, yeah, and some of them just turn in the wrong answers with no real thought behind it. So like Shirley said, I think um, it might be time to reconsider that. Um, I started adding some, just of my, some of my own questions to the end. And then we normally only like pick a couple out to grade uh, so I'll definitely be grading those uh, moving forward, or at least one of them, because, you know, I, what I try to express to them, and I don't think they hear sometimes, is that this is not worth much of your grade. Uh, this is really a way for you to support the learning that you're doing in the class, so that when you get to the quiz or the exam, which is worth, a, you know, way more, you know, you're going to do better on it. So if you just don't take it for what it's worth, and you just kind of throw, the, throw down the answer that you got out of a book, it's not really going to be helpful when it really matters. Yeah, and I think one thing um, that would be interesting to think about is are there other ways or more creative ways of getting students more engaged with homework? Um, I don't know that there's a lot of electronic homework systems out there for inorganic chemistry, which is often what we're more familiar with in a gen chem setting that helps to kind of push this. Um, and I, um, Ann Bentley at one point and I had had a good discussion and she used to do these like daily problem sets, which was uh, kind of a nice way to make sure they were sitting on top of material. And then I would just do um, recommended problems each week from the book. I like that better because I could just like keep on top of grading two problems a day as opposed to this like huge problem set that I got. 
But the downside to that is they don't have a lot of time or more comprehensive problems to sort of come back to. So I, I don't feel like I have a good solution there yet either, but um, I'd love to hear more suggestions from people on the, the Discord channel about this. Um, if others out there in the world have good ideas for addressing homework and inorganic courses. All right. So I do know that uh, your spring break starts in just a couple of hours, which is great. So I will say thank you for this wonderful conversation today and for everyone who came to watch this edition of the Newbies Nano Chat video. I encourage everybody to continue the conversations about teaching in organic chemistry on our Discord channel, The Viper Pit, and I uh, hope you will tune in for future episodes. But just a note that the newbies will be off for a week since they have their spring break upcoming. So you'll have to come back the week after that for the next edition. Thanks, Thank Amanda. Thanks. Thanks, have Anna. a good spring break. <laughs>